Hi, I'm your mathematics tutor Mindy from Apex Tutoring. In these videos, I'm working through the 2019 HSC Mathematics Standard 2 exam. In the last video, we just finished question 23. So in this one, we'll work through questions 24 through 30. Don't forget, there will be timestamps for the beginning of each question in the description in case you want to jump ahead. Okay, question 24 says, Amanda uses 80 kilocalories of energy per kilometer while she is running. She eats a burger that contains 2,180 kilojoules of energy. How many kilometers will she need to run to use up all the energy from the burger? Give your answer correct to one decimal place. And then it tells us that one kilocalorie is 4.184 kilojoules. Okay, so the energy expenditure in this question is given in kilocalories, while the energy in the food is given in kilojoules. So we will need to convert one to the other and then see how many kilometers she'll need to run to burn off that much energy. It might be easiest to convert the kilocalories she burns from running into kilojoules since Every one kilocalorie is 4.184 kilojoules. That means we can just multiply the 80 kilocalories times 4.184 to convert it. So on the calculator, we'll do 80 times 4.184 to get 334.72. So Amanda uses 334.72 kilojoules for every kilometer she runs. All right, now we need to know how many kilometers she would have to run to burn the 2,180 kilojoules she ate from the burger. That comes down to working out how many sets of 334.72 there are in the 2,180 kilojoules. So to work that out, we can take the 2,180 and divide it by 334.72. And we get 6.51 in a few more decimal places. The question wants us to round this to one decimal place. So 6.51 will round down to 6.5. So 6.5 kilometers is the answer. Okay, let's go to question 25. Question 25 says, a bowl of fruit contains 17 apples, of which 9 are red and 8 are green. Dennis takes one apple at random and eats it. Margaret also takes an apple at random and eats it. By drawing a probability tree diagram, or otherwise, find the probability that Dennis and Margaret eat apples of the same color. A probability tree diagram can be a very useful tool for working out probabilities of various outcomes. So let's make the first outcome Dennis's apple. Dennis can choose either a red or a green apple. If he's choosing first, there are 9 out of 17 red apples and 8 out of 17 green apples in the bowl. Now let's see what happens when Margaret chooses her apple. There are two cases to consider. In the first case, Dennis has chosen a red apple first. So when Margaret chooses her apple, she can get either red or green, but the probabilities have changed slightly since Dennis took an apple and didn't put it back. So, in this case where Dennis had chosen the red apple first, 
there are now only 8 out of 16 red apples left, but there are still 8 green apples left out of 16. In the other case, Dennis chose a green apple first. So if that's what happened, when Margaret chooses an apple, she can choose red or green. But in this case, there will be nine red apples out of 16 apples left, but only seven out of 16 green apples. Now, we don't need to work out all the outcomes and all the probabilities since we're only interested in the outcomes where they both got the same color. So let's focus on the outcome where Dennis chose red and then Margaret chose red, which we might call RR. The probability of getting the red and then the red is 9 over 17 times 8 over 16. And the outcome where they both choose green apples, which we might call GG, is 8 over 17 times 7 over 16. Let's work each of these outcomes probabilities out. So the first one is 9 over 17 times 8 over 16. That's 9 over 34. And the second is 8 over 17 times 7 over 16, which is 7 over 34. So there are two ways for them to get apples of the same color, red, red, or green, green. So overall, the total probability of them getting apples of the same color will be 9 over 34 plus 7 over 34 that's 16 over 34. We may simplify that to 8 over 17. You might also put that into a decimal or a percentage, but as a fraction, we won't have to worry about any rounding. So 8 over 17 is our answer. Let's go on to question 26. Okay, question 26 says, a project requires activities A to F to be completed. The activity chart shows the immediate prerequisites and duration for each activity. So we have an activity chart, and then part A says, by drawing a network diagram, determine the minimum time for the project to be completed. Okay, to draw a network diagram from an activity chart, we need to first start with any activities that have no prerequisites. We can see that only activity A has no prerequisites. So I'll draw the start vertex. And activity A coming off of the start. So an activity on one of these networks is a line. Don't forget to put an arrow to show the direction. And to label it, this is activity A, and we'll put the duration next to that, which is 2. We'll then look for any activities that have A as a prerequisite. Both B and C have A as their prerequisites, so activities B and C will come off of the end of A. So I'll put an ending vertex for A, which will also be the start of B and C. And I'll draw activities B with a duration of 6 and C with a duration of 5. Next, we can see D has a prerequisite of B. So at the end of B, I have activity D with a duration of 2. And next, we can see E has prerequisites of both C and D. That means that E cannot start until both C and D are complete. So the ends of C and D need to connect to the beginning of E. One way I can do that 
is to maybe extend the end of C to meet the end of D. But to clean up the diagram a little bit, I'm just going to redraw C to meet the end of D this way. And then I can draw E coming off of both C and D. And E has a duration of 4. Lastly, activity F has a prerequisite of E. So at the end of E, we have F with a duration of 1. That's the last activity. So at the end of the last activity, we have the end vertex. All right, that completes our network diagram, but we still need to find the minimum time for completion. To do that, we'll need to do a forward scan, which will require us to draw a box at the beginning of each activity. We might want to check ahead, though, in case we also need a backward scan. And if you see on part B, which asks for float time, that tells us we'll need to do a backward scan as well eventually. So let's draw a double box at the beginning of each activity for our forward and backward scan. Okay, so this will belong to the beginning of activity A. I'm going to label them so it's a little less confusing with everything going on. We'll need one for the beginning of B and C at this vertex. We'll need one for the beginning of D here at this vertex for E. and F. We can also draw one at the end. To do a forward scan, we start at the beginning with zero. And as we go through the forward scan, we fill in the first box at each vertex with the total time to get to that point. If there's ever two ways to get to the same point, we choose the longest time because the forward scan gives us the earliest start time of each activity. And an activity can't start until all of its prerequisites are completed. So the longest time to get to a point will indicate the earliest that that activity will be able to start. So let's go from the start along activity A, which has a duration of two. So we fill in the boxes for B and C with two. Now let's get the earliest start time for D, where we can see that to get to the beginning of B will be two hours, and then B has a duration of six. So the earliest D can start will be two plus six, which will be eight. Let's then take a look at activity E and its earliest start time. There's two ways to get to activity E, via D or C. Now with D, we have an earlier start time of eight and then D takes two hours. So if we go along that way, it'll take 10 hours. If we go along C, C's earliest start time is two and then C will take five hours for a duration of seven. And once again, we always take the longest route, which in this case will be along D, which is 10. So E's earliest start time is 10. We'll then get to F, taking E's earliest start time of 10 plus E's duration of 4 to give us 14 as F's earliest start time, and then adding the duration of F of 1 to get to the end, and we get 15. Now the end means the project is completed. So the earliest that the project can be completed it's 15 hours. And that is our answer. Okay, part B says, determine the float time 
of the non-critical activity. So flow times are found when we do our backward scan. To do a backward scan, we start at the end, filling in the completion time of the project, and then working backwards, subtracting the duration of each activity. The backward scan will then give us the latest start time of each activity, and the flow time will be the difference between the earliest start time and the latest start time. So let's go and subtract. So we're working back along F now, subtracting its duration of 1 to get 14, and then subtracting E's duration of 4 to get 10. Now, if we go along D, we can subtract 2, 10, take away 2 is 8, and then subtracting B, 8 take away 6 is 2. Let's not forget to fill in C. So for C, let's go back to its ending here, which we, were, we had left off with 10, and then subtract C's duration of 5 to get 5. We now have what we need to answer the question, but we could finish this up by going back to the very start. When you have a choice between two activities, latest start times here at the end of A, we can choose between 2 from B or 5 from C. We choose the smallest time. It's the opposite when you do a backward scan. And we choose the smallest, which is 2, minus 2 from A, which gives us 0 at the beginning. So the activities that have the same latest start time and earliest start time are those that we say are on the critical path. These are all the activities that are taking the longest and determining the total completion time for the project. We can notice that on activity C, there is a difference between the earliest and latest start times, 2 and 5. And that's because the other path is taking longer. So activity C can be delayed a little bit. And that flow time, the difference between the 2 and the 5, is how much it can be delayed without delaying the entire project. That's what we call the float time. The float time for activity C, the non-critical activity, because it's not on the critical path, is 5 minus 2, which is 3 hours. And that's our answer. Let's go on to question 27. Question 27 says, Ashley has a credit card with the following conditions. There is no interest-free period. Interest is charged at the end of each month at 18.25% per annum, compounding daily from the purchase date included to the last day of the month included. Ashley's credit card statement for April is shown with some figures missing. So we have the statement. And then it says, the minimum payment is calculated at 2% of the closing balance on 30 April. Calculate the minimum payment. So to get the minimum payment, we'll need to find the closing balance at the end of April and take 2%. To get the closing balance, which is missing, we'll have to work out the interest charged and add that to all the purchases. So, interest is charged at 18.25% per annum compounded daily, so we will need to use the compound interest formula. But since it's compounded daily, we'll need to know what that interest is per day and how many days. To get the daily interest rate, we'll take the 18.25% divided by 365. To save us from working with some really long decimals, I'll just take this as the percentage. We'll then work out how many days the interest is charged for. The furniture was purchased 
on the 20th of April. There are 30 days in April, but be careful because even though the difference between 30 and 20 is 10, when we include the date of purchase and the last day, the number of days that the interest will be charged for will be one extra. So it should be 10 plus one days or 11 days. If that seems a little weird, you can count it out and don't forget to include the date of purchase. The 20th is the first day, and then we'll have the 21st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, and then the 30th. That's 11 days. All right, let's just find the interest now using the compound interest formula, which is on the reference sheet. This formula here, FV equals PV bracket 1 plus R to the N, is the compound interest formula. So we'll fill in the values, PV, present value, sometimes called the principal in compound interest, is the cost of the furniture, 3700 Here's why I put our interest rate, 8.25 over 365%. The power of 11 days. So let's put this in the calculator. And we'll get $3,720.40. Don't forget that the compound interest formula will include both the PV and the interest together. The difference is the interest charged, which we can see is just $20.40 since the PV was $3,700. The closing balance will be the furniture plus the interest which will be what the compound interest formula has given us. $3,720.40. So then the minimum payment is just 2% of that. So we'll calculate 2% of $3,720.40 by timesing it by 2%. We could enter this as the percentage in this calculator or the decimal 0 0.02 if you like. And we'll get $74.41 if we're rounding it, since after that 40 is an H, it rounds up to 41. And that is our answer. All right, let's go to question 28. All right, question 28 says, the formula below is used to calculate an estimate for blood alcohol content, BAC, for females. We have the formula, and then it says, the number of hours required for a person to reach zero BAC after they stop consuming alcohol is given by the following formula. And we have another one. The number of standard drinks in a glass of wine and a glass of spirits is shown. It's showing us that wine is 1.2 standard drinks and spirits is one standard drink. It then says, Hannah weighs 60 kilograms. She consumed three glasses of wine and four glasses of spirits between 6.15 p.m. and 12.30 a.m. the following day. She then stopped drinking alcohol. Using the given formulae, calculate the time in the morning when Hannah's BAC should reach zero. Okay, to find the time that her BAC will reach zero, we'll need to know what her BAC is when she stops consuming alcohol. 
To do that, we'll use the BAC formula. While the BAC formula will be given to us in the exam, we need to know what each of the parts of it means. So BAC, in this case for a female, is 10 times N. N is the number of standard drinks consumed minus 7.5 times H, where H is the number of hours over which they are consumed, all over 5.5 times M, where M is the mass of the person or their weight in kilograms. We'll need to work out N and H, and we are given M. So let's find out how many standard drinks Hannah consumes, which will be N. She consumes three glasses of wine, each of which is 1.2 standard drinks. So that's three times 1.2. She also drinks four glasses of spirits, each of which is one standard drink. So we'll add to that four times one. So that will come out to 7.6 standard drinks. Next, let's find H, the number of hours over which she consumes these 7.6 standard drinks. So the problem gives us that she starts at 6.15 p.m. and stops at 12.30 a.m. There would be six hours going from 6.15 p.m to 12.15 a.m. and then another 15 minutes to get to 12.30 a.m. So that is six hours and 15 minutes. H needs to be in hours only though, so we need to convert the 15 minutes into a fraction of an hour. We know that 15 minutes is a quarter of an hour, so we can put this as six and one quarter hours, or a little easier to put in the calculator, 6.25 hours. But either would be okay. Now we have everything that we need to go into the BAC formula. We'll do 10 times N, which is 7.6 minus 7.5 times H, which is 6.25, all over 5.5 times M, her mass, which is given in the problem to be 60. Now we'll just put that on the calculator. I'll just start by pulling up the fraction so I can put everything into the numerator. And we get 0 0.088 and a few more decimal places. I'll keep that at three decimal places for now. Now we're ready to work out how long it will take for her to reach 0 BAC with this formula. So the time it takes will be the BAC when she finishes drinking, which we just found to be 0 0.088 divided by 0 0.015. On the calculator, I'll use my answer, which is unrounded, which will help us to get a more accurate answer, and I will divide it by 0 0.015. And we get 5.88 dot 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 hours. Now, this question is asking for the time in the morning when her BEC reaches zero. What we have here is how long it takes. So, if she finishes drinking at 12.30 a.m., we'll have to add on the 5.88 hours to find the actual time her BEC reaches zero. Now we have the time in hours with a decimal, and we'd like to go back 
to hours and minutes. A quick and easy way to do that is with the degrees, minutes, and seconds button, which looks like a little circle, an apostrophe, and a double apostrophe. If we press that button, we'll convert this to hours and minutes, and we can see that our answer is equivalent to five hours and 53 minutes. If we add five hours to 12.30 a.m., it will be 5.30 a.m. We can then add the 53 minutes and that will get us to 6.23 a.m. And that is our answer. Let's go to question 29. Question 29 says, part of a supermarket receipt is shown. We have the receipt, and then it says, determine the missing values A and B to complete the receipt. All right, there's two things missing here, labeled A and B. We are given both the total for everything as well as the GST that's included in the total. Now, we may also notice that the only thing that's marked as showing that GST was charged was the first item, the chocolates. That means that the 70 cents of GST came only from that item. Based on that, we can work backwards to find out how much the chocolates were. Since the GST here is the standard 10%, that means that this 70 cents is 10% of the pre-GST price. So let's call the pre-GST price of the chocolate C, and we know that when C is multiplied by 10%, we get 70 cents. We can find C by then dividing by 10%, and 70 cents divided by 10%, which you could enter as a decimal 0 0.1, is 7. So the pre-GST price of the chocolates is $7. Including the GST then will be $7.70. So we'll write A equals $7.70. Now we can work out B. B is the only unknown item left, so it will be whatever is not accounted for then in the total. All right, let's take the $36.25 total and subtract the prices of all the other items. So we'll have to subtract $7.70 for the chocolates, $5 for the tomatoes, $8.50 for the cheese, $3.20 for the milk, and $2.85 for the bananas. That leaves $9 unaccounted for. So the almonds, part B, must be $9. And that is the answer to the question. Let's go to question 30. All right, question 30 says, the network diagram shows the tracks connecting eight picnic sites in a nature park. The vertices A to H represent the picnic sites. The weights on the edges represent the distances along the tracks between the picnic sites in kilometers. We're given the network diagram, and then part A says, each picnic site needs to provide drinking water. The main water source is at site A. By drawing a minimum spanning tree in the space below, calculate the minimum length of water pipes required to supply water to all the sites if the water pipes can only be laid along the tracks. Okay, we need a minimum spanning tree. There's a couple of different ways to produce one, but if you'd like to start 
with a specific vertex in mind. What we then do is add on the shortest edges to connect to the tree without creating a loop. So the only option right now is this edge of four. So we'll add that to our current tree and then look at any edges connected to this tree so far. The options are five and six. And again, we take the shortest. So we will take the five here. Now we have the options of six, four, three, or seven connected to our current tree. The smallest is three. So I'll take the three. Now the edges that connect to our current tree include the six, four, two, seven, five, and five. The smallest is two. So let's add the two. Now we can ignore the six and four. Adding them would create a loop or a cycle. So our options now connected to our current tree are the seven, five, five, or one. Of course, one is the shortest, so we'll add that to our tree. Now we'll consider the seven, five, five, and seven. There's a tie for the shortest between the two fives. When you're creating a minimum spanning tree, there could be more than one correct answer. So if there is a tie, you can pick either one. I'll choose this one. Now we'll stop considering the seven since we would create a loop or a cycle. We'll consider the seven, five, and five. Again, it's a tie. And we can see that there could be two possible minimum spanning trees. We'll just pick one of these fives. I'll pick this one. So this is a minimum spanning tree and we just need to draw it in the space. Technically, you can draw the edges in whatever arrangement you like now, as long as they're still connected in this way. But for simplicity, we'll mainly copy the layout that we currently see. So we'll put A, connect it to B with a length of four, connect to C here with five, H here with three, down to G, with a two and over to F with one. Then we have D with a weight of five and then finally down to E with a weight of five. All right, that's our minimum spanning tree and the minimum length will be the sum of all of the edges. So we'll just add it all up, four plus five plus three plus two plus one and then plus five and plus five to get 25 kilometers. All right, part B says, one day the track between C and H is closed. State the vertices that identify the shortest path from C to E that avoids the closed track. Okay, let's look back at the original diagram. This question is not exactly related to the minimum spanning tree. We're trying to get from C to E, but we can't use the path between C and H. So we'll take that out. Finding the shortest path involves checking all the possible paths to get from one vertex to another. So let's consider the options. We can go from C to D to E. That length is seven plus five, which is 12. Let's see if we can find anything shorter. We can rule out C to D and then to H to E because that is clearly going to be longer. Let's check the path that would go down to G, which will be four, and then over to E along F, and then E. That's four plus one plus seven. That's also 12. Let's see if there's a better way. Let's check again going down to G and then to H and then E. That will be four plus two plus five. That's 11. 
which is shorter than the other two paths. We can check that all of our paths would be longer since everything else involves taking extra paths like this one from C to B to G that are definitely longer than just going down to G. So the shortest path is from C to G to H to E, which gave us 11 kilometers. And that's our answer. And we'll take a break and stop there and pick up with question 31 in the next video.